Uh, my name is Adrian Sanders. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Chargehound. Uh, recently, we were acquired by PayPal. We are a uh, chargeback representment company, so we help merchants automate disputes. Uh, my uh, my guest today on the uh, Payment Innovators series uh, is Paul Paradis, the co-founder and president of Cezzle. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, Cezzel has been doing incredible in recent years as a buy now, pay later solution. Previous to Cezzel, Paul was the director of sales and marketing at Dash and Thompson, a corporate learning development solution. And he has over a decade of experience in sales and ops experience in payments. Uh, so excited to chat about what you guys are up to at Cezzel and sort of your experience getting there as one of the co-founders uh, and, and president. Uh, welcome, Paul. Thank you, Adrian. Really good to be here. Uh, appreciate everybody's time today and happy to share more about Cezzle and, um, you know, all the, the craziness of the, the BNPL industry. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I usually like to start off by just getting real personal first and uh, asking, because I think this is the most fascinating question is, how did you end up in payments? Since I don't feel like anybody, uh, when they're like 10 years old, is like, I want to <laughs> When I grow up, I want to be in payments. Uh, so that's the question I ask is, you know, after a decade of experience in sales and marketing, how did you end up here? It, it's 100% a result of my friendship with our CEO, Charlie Yuakim. Uh, Charlie and I met in the full-time MBA program at the University of Minnesota and became really good friends over some consulting projects and a ping pong table. Um, before Carlson School, Charlie worked for a company called McGann, which builds uh, like parking hardware and software. Um, and so we graduated from Carlson right at the kind of tail end of the financial recession 10 years ago. And so there weren't many mm -hmm. typical MBA jobs to be had. And so Charlie ended up starting a company called Passport. Uh, which started as a, you know, parking hardware and software company. And then over time kind of evolved to become a parking payments company hmm. and passports now, uh, a, you know, one, probably the market leader in payments for transportation. So if you've ever parked on street, like in San Francisco, I think you guys have pay by phone is the big mm -hmm. on street parking app. Um, yep. But passport is probably the market leader in that space. So you park on street in a big city. You pay via mobile app, um, it's Passport. So um, Charlie called me up after leaving Passport back in 2015, asked if I wanted to help him start a new payments company. And he had some ideas for products that were needed in the industry. Yeah. Um, I had always been intrigued by the idea of starting a small business. So I, I jumped into the deep end, uh, took a crash course in payments. Um, and I found it to be a super fascinating industry. You know, it's evolving very rapidly at the moment. Um, you know, especially here in the U.S., I think we're we're a little bit behind when it comes to payment innovation. A lot of different parts of the world, totally. and it feels like we're kind of at the the precipice of a really innovative time for payments infrastructure um, in the U.S. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I feel like that's been a recurring theme on this series, actually talking about, um, and, you know, different people have different interpretations of it, but just how other parts of the world have adapted to a non credit card pervasive environment, right, over the last 10 years and come up with really unique and interesting solutions uh, for payments. I mean, mobile, right, obviously, and yeah. in APAC. Um, but even in Europe, right, just, just, you know, a non credit card native population really in a lot of ways, you know, I lived in Europe for a while and no one had a credit card. Yeah. Uh, and so now to see, okay, they're incorporating credit cards into their everyday consumer behavior, but that's not where they're coming from sort of organically. And so there's just cool products out there. Right. Um, so, um, well, so, so with that kind of talk to me a little bit about, you know, you, you're one of the co-founders of Sezzle. Talk to me about Sezzle's journey. I know that you guys had an interesting pivot. Um, Chargehound also had a pivot. So I, I've, I've been there and all of the fun that, that, that's involved with that. I would love to kind of hear where you guys started and, and how you guys got to, to buy now, pay later. Yeah, so when we started, the, the initial concept was we wanted to create a direct debit platform for e-commerce. 
Um, so we saw data suggesting that young people were migrating away from credit cards toward debit cards. Um, credit card adoption was really low. This was as of like 10 years ago. And um, we initially assumed it was preference that uh, this young consumer was, you know, choosing to be more financially responsible. They wanted to pay for things with the money that they had. Uh, they had record amounts of student debt. And so they were just making a, a wise decision to pay with debit. But with debit, you don't get rewards like you do with a credit card. And yeah. so the idea was let's create a new payment platform that leverages ACH, which is this great ubiquitous payment rail that's really low cost. And there was a lot of really cool technology being applied to bank authentication and ACH companies like Plaid, Yodely, sure. Finicity. And so we thought let's leverage some of this really cool new FinTech to enable ACH payments in an e-commerce context. Before that, it was only for recurring payments like bill payments because the authentication process was so clunky. Sure. You know, you'd have to, a company would drop micro deposits into your account, your checking account, and you'd have to report back like two days later how much they deposited. And that was their way of verifying your ownership of that account. So um, we launched that uh, spring of 17, I think it was. And after having that product live in market for about two to three months, came to the conclusion that consumer adoption was, was not going to be scalable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our biggest issue was that uh, we were an unknown fintech company asking for people to log into their bank in a checkout. So <laughs> that's like, uh, you, have to, you have to trust the company that yeah. you're doing that with a lot. And there's a lot Greetings, of- Greetings, consumer, yeah. put yeah. in your bank details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I still think to this day that if a large- trusted tech company like Apple or Google or something were to try and launch an ACH based uh, payment platform, I think they could do it, right? I think they could do it because there's so much value that's being pulled out of that transaction by middlemen in the credit card networks um, that can be reduced, can be taken away if you go, if you migrate to a lower cost rail like that. And so, um, yeah. So we were starting to think about, you know, how do we how do we solve for this this credit to debit trend, right, mm -hmm. um, in a different way, right? And so we kind of we we flipped our hypothesis to, well, maybe it's not a preference for a debit, maybe it's a lack of access to existing credit or a dislike for traditional credit, right? Yeah. Maybe there's sure. a different way to offer credit that would be more appealing to this young consumer, right? And so. We saw a firm in the US at the time, they were only focused on big ticket financing. Yeah, I remember that. Which is kind of historically where installments have always been in the US. Like you, yep. you go to a furniture store. Like a layaway or whatever, yeah. Yeah, I wanna buy a $1,000 couch and I wanna split it into you know 12 installments or whatever. Um, but we saw you know markets like Brazil, markets like Israel, Australia was starting to come online with companies like Afterpay and Zip targeting more of a, like an everyday spend that's a little bit of a stretch payment for, for a young consumer that's living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. Um, and we thought that that was a great purchase to target because you're talking about a high frequency purchase so you can build loyalty with a consumer. Mm -hmm. They're not using you just once a year like you would with a firm if you're, if you're buying a couch or something. Yeah. So, we, we saw it taking off in Australia, which is a very similar market culturally to the US sure. and from a cons uh, consumer spending standpoint. And so uh, that gave us the confidence that this model would work here and mm -hmm. took about three months to pivot from that ACH platform to an installment platform. And we were the first ones to launch a pay and for solution into the US market in August of 17. Right. And uh, as I mentioned to you, you know, before the call, our lead investors, they did not like this idea. They, they were you know, very anti-credit. They didn't think we had enough money to pull it off. Um, but a really cool um, aspect of this business model is because you're dealing with small transactions, the turnover is very, very quick yeah. on, the on the money that you're lending. So you don't actually need a ton of capital to totally. lend out, right? But it's also uh, like, a, it's a, that's, it's uh, to your point, right? 
we don't think of these, this is such a new behavior, right? So yeah. how do you, ident like for VCs, right? What is the risk modeling on this flow that they don't understand? Right. And you're like, hey, this is clearing pretty quickly. And they're like, but it's still debt, right? It's yeah. still on your books. And you're like, yeah. for like a minute <laughs> uh, or whatever it is. So yes. um, yeah. I was just laughing when you're talking about them saying you didn't have enough money. Cause my follow-up question was when do VCs think that you ever have enough money? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Especially when you're lending. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the, the pivot. If, if you're comfortable, just sort of as a co-founder, right. As a leader, um, was that stressful sort of workshopping that with your team trying to rally them was there pushback you don't have to get into details if it doesn't make sense but I, you know i have my own experience with this so i'm always curious to hear other people's it was extremely stressful i mean uh you know, <laughs> that's how i felt <laughs> especially you know i was uh i was head of growth right and so yeah. when you're when you're talking about pivoting your business it's like well do i even have anything to do you yeah know? so you know the conversations around should I take a pause on this, you know, and maybe let them build the new product and maybe I come back, you know, or uh, we had uh, a, a very senior engineer at the time who's now our CTO thinking about going back to school, right? Yeah. And, and try to convince him to stay. And um, even crazier, you know, we had raised a decent amount of money for, for a Minneapolis-based startup. We had raised, you know, $2 million in seed funding. Which yeah. Was, was a yeah. lot. Non-trivial. Um, for, for yeah. companies like us on this concept. And we had, we had won awards, you know, we had won like uh, uh, startup, you know, competition awards sure. based on this idea. And I, I hope I can, I hope I don't get in trouble for sharing this story, but I think this is a really funny story. So right when we were in the middle of deciding whether or not to pivot, we were in the final interview process of joining Target's retail accelerator program. This would have been like three or four years ago. I remember and that program, yeah. And uh, the innovation one or whatever, I forget what, yeah. And so we, we were literally in the final interviews and we were, we were trying to decide whether or not to pitch the idea that we had gotten that far <laughs> in the application process on or pitch this new idea we had around installments. And we ended up pitching the old idea. We didn't get into the, the retail accel accelerator. Well, fast forward two years later, we joined their retail accelerator with our installment idea and it was a super yeah. successful program for us so yeah it was a really interesting time for us to say the least awesome i could i could spend this whole conversation talking about pivots because i think they're incredibly fascinating and just the the psychological factors and all of that stuff but um but i also really want to hear you dig into bnpl because i feel like buy now pay later it kind of took america by a storm like you said i feel like there was sort of a inflection point where people kind of got their heads around it right um and for me personally as a consumer the way i've thought about it is let's say you are going to spend over the course of six months five hundred dollars on you know ten fifty dollar things right? right you know there's kind of this way with bnpl that like you can actually get all those things at the same time right and but mm -hmm. still end up spending five hundred dollars over six months right, right. Yeah. And I think that that's so fascinating because, you know, if you want to go camping, you know, and you want to spend 500 bucks on camping gear, uh, but you want to spend that over six months in the, in the old world, you're either putting that all on the credit card and you're going to, you're going to eat a bunch of fees mm -hmm. um, or you're buying like just the, you know, the, the camper stove or, or whatever, and you don't get a backpack or a sleeping bag. But right. with BNPL, you have this opportunity, right, to, to get all the stuff you need to go and do that, but you're not really extending yourself. Um, so that's what really clicked for me about it. Um, but talk to me a bit about what you guys are seeing and, and the evolution of it, because it really did feel like it was a, a incredibly explosive from, like you said, 2017 until now. Yeah, it, it has been. You know, I think um, first and foremost, I think the reason why it's taken off is because it is a highly demanded product that works for both the merchant and the consumer. Yeah. Um, so you know, what's interesting mm -hmm. is we shifted, you know, traditional financing as a consumer funded model. Yeah. Right? And we shifted that to be a merchant funded model where now you as the merchant are basically offering this really consumer friendly, interest-free installment plan to your shoppers um, 
to enable them to buy more, more of what they want and need. And, and it works, right? And, yeah, and we can totally. show them that the incremental cost to offer this, this merchant funded financing uh, is far outweighed by the incremental sales that you generate by offering it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and beyond just the incremental sales you're offering, the halo effect that it has on your company by offering such a consumer friendly product yeah. People, people trust your brand more. They love your brand more, right? Totally. Um, so there's a lot of different things that that really click there. I think you nailed it. Like free money is hard to turn down, right? Like, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Period, right? Like we're basically giving you uh, free money um, in terms of time value of money, right? Yep. And it's, and it's, um, it's just, I think it's easier to understand for a lot of people. You know, it's built in budgeting. You know exactly how much, you're having to pay and when, and you're not having to worry about APR, how, APR, <laughs> how, how it's going to impact your credit score. You know, I think intentionally um, cons or issuing banks made it really difficult to understand how much to pay and when, and that's, totally. there's a reason for that, right? Yep. It has um, nothing to do with helping the consumer. No, it's, it's to do with yeah. making more money uh, yes. because they make yeah. money when you don't pay them on time. Whereas we actually lose money when you don't pay us on time. Yeah. So our, our incentives are completely aligned with the consumer. We only want to give out as much money as they can afford to pay us back. Right. I, I um, love this. I love this as a concept. Sorry, just the, no, this something right. that you're, that you're highlighting that I, I think is really fascinating is there is this emergence among the new offerings, the new wave of, of payments companies where you're looking constantly for alignment between not just merchants and the and the third party vendor like yourself, but with the consumer, right? And that, you know, you're saying, hey, look, th these sort of what I would consider traditionally models as being kind of predatory to the consumer, where right. you're creating misalignment. So it's always right. going to be this antagonistic antagonistic relationship. Yeah. Whereas in your model, it's like, hey, there's no reason why there shouldn't be continual alignment here where everybody wins, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that we're seeing that more and more with these consumer facing products and these new fintech companies that are really successful. So I, I just love that as like a highlight. I agree. And I, I think it goes to the fact that it was just, if you look at banking, traditional banking, the, no one hardly ever switches banks. The switching costs are really high. You, there's just a ton of accounts that you'd have to transfer. And so yeah. I think it was easy for banks to get away with treating people poorly. Um, yep. Banks were also very regional. So you didn't have a lot of selection even yeah. if you wanted to switch. Information so think, was siloed, all that stuff. Yeah. So I think because of technology, um, the switching costs are a lot lower now. And we're just able to create much better customer experiences than banks have been able to provide. Yeah. And I think BNPL really is like, it's just such a good distillation of that. Uh, and um, it, I think it's a great sort of use case to see why that works now um, and maybe couldn't have in the past. Right. Um, I, want, I wanted to move on to uh, this next piece, uh, next topic, financially empowering the next generation. Mm. Uh, I know from, you know, some of the stuff that you guys have done that you guys are really big into CSR work. Mm -hmm. uh, you're really into thinking about, you know, the next generation of change makers and businesses and, and ultimately people. Uh, talk to me a bit about that, how that came to be or, or what's driving that for you guys. And it does seem so important to your leadership group. Uh, I would love to understand sort of where that came from and, and why it's so important to you? It, it really came from our founding story. So when I was talking about how we wanted to build an ACH based payment platform, it was a, around the idea of let's harvest this value that's being taken away from merchants and consumers and given to a bunch of middlemen in the payment networks and give it back to merchants and consumers, right? And so really our, our company founding story was based on this idea of, you know, making things a little bit more fair and doing the right thing. So when we decided to pivot to the installment model, our team was really determined not to be just another credit provider. Yeah. Historically, lenders make their money on interest and hidden fees. So we wanted to flip that model on its head and really try and be the most consumer friendly product possible. Um, and part of that is reflected in just kind of how our product works and functions, but we wanted to go further than that and really create an entire brand around this ethos of financial empowerment and doing cool. good. 
and making yeah. sure that every decision we make as a company is, is, is taken through that lens. And I think consumers care about how companies are affecting the environment, how they're affecting their communities that they're based in, uh, how they're impacting their employees. Um, and I think consumers are becoming more and more loyal to companies that stand for more than just making profit, right? So it's been in our DNA since the beginning. Um, and not only is it the right thing to do, but we, we think it's good for business too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we try to stay focused on that mission of financial empowerment and find opportunities to give back while fulfilling that mission, right? So, for example, we work with um, a nonprofit called Trees for the Future, where we donate a tree for every new user to sizzle. Well, not only is this good for the environment because they're planting trees, but the trees are actually fruit and nut producing trees in Africa that cool. are helping to financially empower yeah. African farmers, right? right? Um, another example is we partner with Ministry of Supply to donate these starter kits of dress clothing to mm -hmm. underprivileged consumers who are interviewing to get back into the workforce post pandemic. Right. So just a couple examples of, you know, causes that make a difference, but are also focused on financially empowering people. Right. Um, yeah. So it, it aligns with our mission as well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I love that. And yeah, I, I'm a big believer in that. I think that again, it's all about creating this alignment and being empathetic to the communities that you participate in. And, you know, what, what are you, what are we really doing? What are we, what are we trying to do? And at the end of the day, if it's just predatory and you're just trying to make money, um, it's pretty hard to, to grind out a pivot, you know, or, or do anything like that. Um, I think or it's have really motivated important. employees. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah they could just go work at a bank if that's what they wanted yeah. to do. So yeah. um, awesome. I love it. Talk to me about, we have some audience questions. So I want to throw them out here. Uh, how, whatever comfort level you are answering these, uh, I don't think there's going to be, um, there's going to be too much uh, that's spicy, but we'll see. Uh, talk to me about the entry of Apple pay into the buy now uh, pay later uh, space. Will that be a big shift in the industry? Will it impact you guys at Sezzle specifically or, you know, just generally, what are your thoughts there on, on that? Yeah, I think, first of all, I think it's, we don't know anything about what it's going to look like, right? I think it was a, something that was leaked anonymously to Bloomberg. Um, you know, we don't know if it was by an Apple employee or a Goldman employee or who, you know, who leaked it. And so, and I think also, you know, buy now, pay later has become this kind of catch-all for installment financing. And there's so many different flavors of, of BNPL. And, sure. you know, you have Amex with their planet feature where post-purchase, you can choose to place a purchase on an installment plan that's interest-bearing, yep. right? And that's, that's kind of the common model for credit card issuers. Um, then you have, you know, the affirms of the world and breads that are focused on longer-term installment-bearing loans. Um, and then you have more of the pure play kind of short term after pay, Klarna, Sezzle, quad pay, right? So it's really hard to know if Apple launches something like this, what it's going to look like, right? But my best guess is, so, so first of all, I think it, it validates the, the industry big time, right? If, if, yep. if one of the yes. biggest companies in the world is getting say into that. this, right? It's like, okay, you're doing something right if, if they're wanting to get into this. Yep. Um, and then I, I think because it's supposedly in partnership with Goldman, those big banks really aren't too interested in lending uh, hundred dollar installment plans. They're, they're they make their money on the larger, longer term interest bearing installment stuff. So if I had to guess where it's going to go, I think it's going to look more like that, or more like the Amex kind of planet feature where right you can make a purchase and maybe choose to put it on an installment plan if it's of a certain size. Apple itself, I think they'd have a really hard time launching this product on their own because they just don't make enough money per transaction to enable you to put everything on an installment plan, no matter what card you have attached to their wallet. They just don't make enough. I think they only make like 15 to 25 basis points, something like that per transaction. And that is not enough money to successfully run a buy now, pay later business. So right. I think there's just a lot of questions that need to be answered, but for the short term, I think it gives us validation 
Yeah. And um, we're just going to have to continue to push to add value so that if they do build a competitive product, we, we have more to offer to the consumer and to the merchant because we've been doing it longer and we have more features and functionality and, and value. Sure. Uh, just a couple more quick questions. Uh, what role do you see BNPL having on the price of credit card interchange, if at all? That's a really good question. I, I think, um, I don't know. You know, credit card interchange, so it's unregulated here in the US for the most part, which is unique to our market, right? So yeah. it's, it's a lot more regulated in, in other parts of the world. Um, BNPL inherently just costs more uh, as a business model to run. So, sure. you know, I don't know if you saw, we just announced a partnership with Discover a week or two ago. And a big part of that partnership is they're going to be giving us exclusive access to a new IIN or bin range for BNPL yeah, I, that will allow us to, to actually charge the merchant a little bit more money um, because interchange is prohibitive for BNPL. It's actually not a high enough rate to operate a BNPL profitably. So um, I don't think it's gonna have a lot of pressure on credit card interchange, but I think like what we're doing with Discover, I think it could lead to new interchange levels that are specific sure. to our industry. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then sort of last question on a high level, BNPL in the next five years, what, what are we looking at? Oh boy. Um, well, so I think you're just starting to see adoption by mass merchants in the US of BNPL, right? So that's kind of the final frontier on the merchant front. It went from, I think, kind of this more niche uh, alternative payment method in small business and fashion and beauty. And now it's really kind of becoming pervasive across almost every retail category and adopted mm -hmm. by the largest merchants. So it's, it's going to be uh, ubiquity right in the next year to two is, is kind of the, the yeah. name of the game. We're also all expanding very quickly internationally. Um, I think this business model out of any credit model you could launch lends itself to global expansion because yes. yeah. it's, it's less risk. You're lending a small amount of money to a lot of people and it's kind of this honor system. And so as long as you have solid fraud models, um, I think it's really uh, quite nice to launch this into other markets and scale quickly. So I think international expansion will be big. And then I think really because, you know, if you think about it, I think what we've solved for is a broken customer acquisition funnel for banks with the credit cards. Mm -hmm. They're not acquiring young consumers anymore. And they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're being adopted by BNPLs and Neo banks. And so I think we really have the opportunity because we're gaining users so fast, because we're gaining merchant acceptance so quickly, because we're raising capital so quickly, large amounts of it, we really have an opportunity as a category to completely flip, you know, consumer lending and financial services on its head and really innovate the products and services being offered to consumers digitally, right? And so I think it's going to be a really fascinating next five years to see the, 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 the core banking traditional products that have been offered the same way for the last 30 years, how, can the, how those can be reimagined and reinvented right sure um yeah through, through mobile app through virtual card through all these uh, cool new things that different fintech companies are offering and putting them all together into one package you know yeah awesome paul paradis thank you so much for joining us from sezzle uh anything else you want to shout out before we wrap this up anything you want to tell the audience out there no, I, I just say, you know, if, if you haven't looked at BNPL, which I doubt, I mean, it seems like everybody's talking about it, looking at it, but if, if you haven't, definitely look at the space and um, look at all your options out there. Like I was saying earlier, I think BNPL has kind of become this catch-all, uh, but really all of us are a little bit different, right? And so do your homework, uh, try to understand what you think would be the best alignment for your brand and your customers, and then, um, and then test. And then also I would say, you know, um, we're seeing a real big push in merchants adopting more than one solution. I think that really this is going to become kind of the, uh, like the credit card networks where you have to have Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover. We're all building massive user bases that are loyal to us. And so I think, you know, even if you've used one for the past one, two, three years, um, think about adding more than one, you know, and if you have any questions about the industry or about Sezzle, please reach out to me, paul at sezzle.com. I'm happy to help. Awesome.
Paul, thank you so much. Everyone else, thank you for joining us. Coming up in September, we'll have Nick Milanovic, head of BD and strategy at Google Pay uh, and author of the popular FinTech newsletter This Week in FinTech. Uh, also, y'all can check out and subscribe to the Chargehound newsletter and stay up to date on our blog. Uh, but again, Paul, thanks for stopping by uh, and everybody else, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Adrian. See ya. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.